and then, of course, he broke a rule, such as the rule against pretending to be a tiger when his sister Mary was supposed to be getting to sleep. Generally speaking, however, he behaved very well. He should have behaved better. He lived in a comfortable house surrounded by a green lawn and wide spreading shade trees that were suitable for climbing. His mother was gentle as well as practical. His father, when he didn't have to hurry to town, spent hours telling John interesting things about baseball, beetles, birds, nests, boats, brigands, and butterflies. John went to school and liked it. His teacher, Miss Plimasol, was fairly easy to get along with, as long as he did careful work. He had received a new shiny golden trumpet and music lessons as a going to school present. Mrs. Quavar, the music teacher, had soon agreed to let him play small parts, a few notes at a time, with the school orchestra. Finally, let me just move this. There was Susan Buttercup who was in his class. Susan had soft yellow curls, round pink cheeks, blue eyes, and one of the best collections of marbles in the neighborhood. John should have been completely well behaved, but he wasn't. He had one bad fault. He was a pig about candy. Boiled candy, cotton candy, licorice all sorts old-fashioned toffee, candy orange and lemon slices, Cracker Jack, jelly beans, fudge, black currant lozenges for ticklish throats, nougat, maroon glaces, acid drops, peppermint sticks, lollipops, marshmallows, and above all, chocolate. He devoured them all. Mother. Oh, let's make sure we're on mute. While other boys and girls spent their money on model airplanes, magazines, skipping ropes, and pet lizards, John studied the candy counters. All his money went on candy, and all his candy went to himself. He never shared it. John Midas was candy mad. At lunch one Saturday, Mrs. Midas noticed a couple of red spots at the end of John's nose. Look, she said to Mr. Midas, John has spots. Mr. Midas leaned forward to look at them. He gravely shook his head and clicked his tongue. John tried to look too, but it was very difficult to see the end of your own nose without a mirror, unless you happen to be an elephant with a long nose that you can bend double. When John tried to look at the end of his nose, first with one eye and then with the other, and then with both together, all that he could see was a pink blur. Besides, trying to look at something so close made his eyes ache. I can't see spots, mother, John said. Well, I can, Mr. Midas said. Just because you don't see a thing doesn't always mean it isn't there. Try feeling the end of the, your nose with your finger. John rubbed his finger over the tip of his nose. It felt a bit rough. It may be measles, Mrs. Midas said anxiously. She placed her hand on John's forehead to feel whether he was warmer than usual. But I don't think he has a temperature, she decided. I suspect John has been eating too much candy again, Mr. Midas said. Have you been eating candy this morning, John? Some, John admitted. What, Mr. Midas asked. Well, John replied. Well, I had a few cream delights. Susan gave them to me. Anything else, Mr. Midas asked. A little toffee crunch, John said. And what else, Mr. Midas asked, beginning to look cross. 
John's ears grew red. He knew he wasn't supposed to eat candy before meals. Oh, only, er, uh, uh, hardly anything else, he said. John, Mr. Midas said, and his son recognized the tone. It meant that John had to tell everything. It turned out that John had been around to see most of his friends and had managed to get candy from nearly all of them. The list he recited was a long one. No wonder you have spots, Mr. Midas commented at last. I think we better take John to see Dr. Cranium, he said to Mrs. Minus. Dr. Cranium was a tall, thin man with a bald head and a gray mustache. He looked through his glasses as John, at John and said, hmm. He eats a lot of candy, Mr. Midas said. He hasn't been eating his meals properly, Mrs. Midas said. Just what I thought, Dr. Cranium said. I can tell by looking at him that he eats too much candy. He eats much too much candy. The doctor shone a little electric light into John's right ear. Then he shone it into John's left ear. Then he shone it into John's nose. He told John to open wide and say, ah. Then he shone the light into John's mouth. Much too much candy. Gracious me, he seems to be full of candy. He told John to sit down and relax. Then he picked up a small rubber headed hammer and gave John a light tap on the right knee, just below the joint. John's foot gave a weak kick. John giggled. It's nothing to laugh about, Mr. Midas said. No, John, the doctor reproved him. A healthy little boy who didn't eat too much candy would kick harder than that. I'm sorry, John said politely, but I can kick harder if you want me to. He gave a sudden high kick, which knocked the hammer out of Dr. Cranium's hand. It landed on its rubber head and bounced across the room. John, exclaimed Mrs. Midas. I'm so sorry, Dr. Cranium. John, I'm sorry. John, exclaimed Mrs. Midas. I'm so sorry, Dr. Cranium. John, tell the doctor you're sorry for kicking his hammer. I'm sorry I kicked your hammer, John said. I would recommend less candy, Dr. Cranium told Mr. and Mrs. Midas. An upset stomach can lead to all sorts of complications. On the way home, Mrs. Midas tried to explain to John what she thought the doctor meant by complications. You see, she said, if you put too much of one kind of food in your stomach and not enough of other kinds, it's bad for your whole body because different parts of your body need different kinds of food. Do you understand? I think so, John said. You've been eating so much sweet stuff, Mr. Midas added, that there isn't room for eggs and meat and milk and bread and spinach and apples and fish and bananas and all the other things you're supposed to have to make your stomach grow big and strong. I like bananas, John said especially the thin slices covered with chocolate. They're called banana surprises. Mr. Midas looked at Mrs. Midas and Mrs. Midas looked at Mr. Midas. They both shrugged their shoulders. Sometimes it was hard to make John understand things. At home, while Mrs. Midas was busy in the kitchen, Mr. Midas continued to reason with John. You mean you'd rather eat candy than anything else and chocolate rather than any kind of candy? Mr. Midas asked. Yes, John reassured him. Oh, yes. Don't you think there is such a thing as enough? Mr. Midas persisted. Don't you think that things are better in their places? I mean, don't you think there's a time for spaghetti and a time for roast beef and even a time for pickled herring and garlic toast? as well as a time for chocolate? 
Or would you rather have chocolate all the time? Chocolate all the time, John replied emphatically. Chocolate's best, that's all. Other things are just food, but chocolate's chocolate. Chocolate? I think I understand, Mr. Midas broke in sharply. Very well. He took a deep breath and went on. John, he said, if you can't understand what sort of diet is really best for you, can't you at least get it into your head that you make your mother very unhappy when you eat so much candy that you can't eat anything else? The conversation always seemed to get around the effect of John's candy eating on John's mother. John couldn't see how it could possibly do her harm if he ate candy. He sat silent for a moment. Then he said, may I go out and play, please, Daddy? Chapter two. Let me just go on and make sure no one's waiting to be accepted. Nope, okay. Chapter two. It was Sunday afternoon. The sun was sinking low in the sky, but the air was still quite warm. John was wandering along the direction of Susan's house, absent-mindedly looking down at the sidewalk when his eye was suddenly caught by a dully gleaming silvery gray coin lying right in his path. The coin was the size of a quarter, but even as he leaned forward eagerly to pick it up, John noticed there was something strange about it. It did not have a picture of George Washington or a picture of an eagle. On one side, there was a picture of a fat boy. On the other side were the letters J-N, which was funny, John thought, because those hat letters happened to be his initials. Gas grasping the coin firmly, he ran on towards Susan's house. She liked to collect things. He thought she might be interested to know he had the beginning of a coin collection. Although he was in the habit of going over to Susan's at the same route once or twice almost every day, this afternoon, John found himself turning left where he usually turned right. I always go the same right way, he thought. This time for a change, I'm going a new way. He didn't stop to consider that you cannot go east by going west unless you go all the way around the world. Only two blocks along the unfamiliar street, John came to a small corner store. It was a neat red brick building with two big show windows. They were full of all sorts of candy. Susan was immediately forgotten about. John pressed his nose against one of the windows. He was imagining the taste of chocolate covered almonds and chocolate fudge on the other side of the glass when he noticed a man with a white apron standing behind the counter and beckoning to him. John was, John was surprised. He hadn't expected the store to be open on Sunday. Don't just stand in the doorway, John, the man called heartily. Come on in and get some fresh, sweet, creamy chocolate. There's a special sale today. How did the man know his name? John wondered. He couldn't remember ever having seen the store before. The storekeeper saw John hesitate. The chocolate I use in my kitchen comes direct from the heart of Africa. He said, I use none but the finest ingredients. And my recipes? Well, I bet you've never had chocolate like mine before. Come on in. Thank you, John replied, walking to the counter. But you see, the trouble is, well, no money? The storekeeper asked, no money whatsoever? What have you got there in your right hand? John had forgotten about the old coin in his hand. 
Oh, he said, this is part of my coin collection. I mean, he added more honestly, I'm going to save this coin and then get lot, get more to make a collection. Let me have a look at it, the storekeeper said. He looked briefly at the coin. Aha, he exclaimed. Is it any good? John asked, his hopes suddenly rising. Very good, said the storekeeper. In fact, it's the only kind of money I accept. But I don't suppose you'd want to spend it on a box. A whole box? I imagine you'd rather keep this for your coin collection than spend it on the chocolate, wouldn't you? Oh, no, John said. Chocolate any day. Go ahead, then. Help yourself, the storekeeper said, pointing to a heavy laden show table piled high with large cellophane wrapped candy boxes, all exactly alike. You mean I can have one of these? John asked, his eye or eyes round with surprise. The candy boxes were as big as one of his father's always brought home at Christmas time. Just help yourself, the storekeeper assured him. That is, unless you think it might be better to ask your mother first. She wouldn't mind, John said hastily and blushed. The storekeeper winked knowingly. I'm sure she won't, he agreed. Not in the long run, anyway. John tucked one of the large boxes under his arm, declined the storekeeper's offer to wrap it as a gift, thanked him, and hurried out of the store before there could be any question of anyone's changing his mind. The storekeeper smiled as he watched his customer hurrying away down the street. John decided that it might be sensible to enter his house quietly by the way of the kitchen. With the large candy box hidden behind him, he let himself in by the back door and crept up the kitchen stairway on tiptoe toward his own room on the top floor. Just as he was about to turn around the corner on the second floor to continue his way upstairs, he had to stop for a moment while his father walked by, coming along the hall from the bedroom telephone. That was Mrs. Buttercup on the phone. Mrs. Midas called to Miss, Mr. Midas called to Mrs. Butter, Mrs. Midas as he walked down the front stairs. She said she was sorry John hadn't been able to get over to play with Susan this afternoon, but it was a good thing in a way, she thought, because Susan's already so excited about her birthday party tomorrow. I wonder where John could have got to. As soon as the second floor was quiet again and John knew there was no danger that his candy box would be seen, he hurried silently to his bedroom, pushed open the door and slid the box under his bed. Then he walked heavily down to the living room. Oh, there you are, said Mrs. Minus. We couldn't imagine where you had been. What have you been doing? Oh, just sort of playing around, John said. John usually took a long time to put his things away and undress and bathe and get ready for bed. For he thought sleeping was a waste of time. But this evening, he started yawning long before his usual bedtime. Hum, ho, ho, hum, Sleepy, John announced. All right, said Mrs. Midas. You'd better be getting to bed. Time for your tonic. John's tonic came in a bottle. It had been prescribed by Dr. Cranium. John had to drink a big spoonful every night to make up for all the vegetables and fruit that he had left on his plate at lunch and dinner. The tonic tasted like soap, mud, glue, ink, and paint. It tasted horrible. Much to Mrs. Midas's surprise, John ran ahead to her to the dining cupboard where the tonic and the tonic spoon were kept. 
By the time she got there, he had already filled the spoon. Then, without coaxing, he emptied it into his mouth. Ugh, John sputtered. Oof, ball, boff. That's a very good boy, Mrs. Midas said. Now, why can't you be sensible and eat up your nice dinner that way? If you'd only stop eating so much candy, you'd be able to eat your meals properly and you wouldn't need to take the tonic. Soon, John was scrubbed and in his pajamas and in bed, ready to be tucked in for the night. Mrs. Midas sat on the bed and stroked his forehead for a moment. Then she leaned forward and kissed his cheek. John, pretending that he was very sleepy, shut his eyes and began breathing deeply. When Mrs. Midas rejoined Mr. Midas in the living room, she said, I've never known John to be so good about going to bed before. He went to sleep in no time. A few seconds after the bedroom door had closed behind his mother, John leapt to the floor, leaped to the floor, got down on his hands and knees and fell under his bed for the candy box. He soon had it on his pillow and set to work unfastening it. First, he took off the thin out, outer layer of cellophane. Then he lifted off the lid. Then he removed a sheet of cardboard. Then he pulled off a sugar square of heavy tin foil. Then he took out a layer of shredded paper. As the wrapping piled up around him, John became rather anxious. At last, he came to a small central ball of cotton batting. And there, right in the middle, was a little golden ball. He picked at the ball with his fingernails and peeled away the golden paper, revealing a tiny piece of plain chocolate. It was the only piece of chocolate in the whole box. Deeply disappointed, John nevertheless put it into his mouth. He had never tasted a chocolate quite like it. It was the most chocolatey chocolate he had ever encountered. In our final chapter of this morning, chapter three. The birds were chirping in the tree outside John's window and the sky beyond was deep blue. The bedroom door opened a few inches. Hey, sleepy, Mrs. Midas called. Everyone else is up. John put his bat on his bathrobe and slippers and ambled to the bathroom. His sister, Mary, was still brushing her teeth and he had to wait until she finished. Come on, Mary, he said a little crossly. Don't take all morning. Here you are, Mary said, handing him the toothpaste tube. While Mary soaked her face, John squeezed a little toothpaste on his toothbrush. The paste was pink. John made a face at the toothbrush. It didn't seem fair that he should have to brush his teeth with stuff that tasted like his tonic. A stinky taste, he called it. John opened his mouth and pushed in the end of the toothbrush. As soon as it touched his fresh front teeth, he noticed a delicious sweetness in his mouth, a taste of the best kind of chocolate. He pushed the brush to and fro and the taste seemed to grow stronger. He removed the brush. The bristles were broken. What kind of toothpaste is this? John asked. Mary was drying her face. The same kind, she answered. It says on the tube. Blanco Dent, John read. It was the same kind they had always had. Why is it chocolate flavored this time, he asked. Boy, it's good. Silly, Mary said. Of course it isn't chocolate. She hung up her towel and swished out of the bathroom. John squeezed some more toothpaste onto his brush and continued to brush his teeth. Chocolate again! It was marvelous. Rich, sweet, smooth chocolate, chocolatey chocolate. 
like the single piece of chocolate from the, cho the box the night before. There seemed to be no further need for toothbrush. So John rinsed it and hung it up. He squeezed out another bit of toothpaste onto his fingertip this time. He put his finger in, the mouth, in his mouth and ate the toothpaste off. When he took his finger out again, it was stained chocolate brown. John wasted no more time. He put the end of the toothpaste tube in his mouth and emptied the paste onto his tongue. It squeezed out like thick, creamy chocolate. Mary looked into the bathroom. Hey, what are you doing? She demanded. Yummy, was all John said. John and Mary were a little late getting to the dining room and Mr. Midas was already on the way, on the way to his train when they sat down at the breakfast table. John ate up all the toothpaste, Mary told his mother. Oh, you sneak, John whispered. Well, you did, Mary reminded him, and that's a waste. Isn't it a waste, mother, to eat up all the toothpaste in one day? Mrs. Midas was serving orange juice. Mary, really? She asked. I'm sure John was only joking. He must have been pretending to eat the toothpaste. No, he wasn't, Mary insisted. I was watching and I saw him squeeze it right into his mouth. He said it was chocolate. Oh dear, protested Mrs. Midas. Chocolate again? Now I know it was just a joke. He just wished it were chocolate. Mary, come on now, drink up your orange juice, both of you. Your bacon and eggs will be ready in a minute. As Mrs. Midas left the room, John took up his glass of orange juice and put it to his lips. As soon as he tilted it, the liquid began flowing into his mouth and a happy look came into his eyes. Boy, that's good, he said at last, lowering the empty glass. Chocolate juice. Mary looked at John. Then she looked her, at her glass of orange juice. It was bright orange color. She tasted it. It tasted like orange to her. It's not chocolate juice, she said. It's orange juice. Orange juice is good for you. Yes, John, Mrs. Midas said, hearing the last few words as she carried the tray of bacon and eggs. You must drink your... She caught sight of John's empty glass. John, she said, you good boy. That's the first time in ages you finished the orange juice without having to be told to. It tasted like chocolate, John explained. All right, Mrs. Mina said, very funny. But don't tease Mary too much. Remember, Mary's younger than you are. John silently picked up his fork and sliced the yolk of his fried egg. The yolk broke over the white and he shivered as he watched it, as he always did. I can't eat this, he told his mother. Of course you can, Mrs. Midas said. You drank your orange juice. Try to eat your bacon and eggs. John scraped a small piece of egg and put it in his mouth. It immediately became chocolate. Chocolate white and chocolate yolk. Both lovely, lovely chocolate. Mmm, John mumbled. Chocolate egg. In almost no time, he had finished every scrap of egg on his plate. Then he tried the bacon. The bacon turned into chocolate too. John had never before enjoyed his breakfast so much. After the orange juice that had turned into chocolate juice and his, in his mouth and the fried bacon and egg that had turned into fried chocolate, he ate two slices of chocolate toast with chocolate butter and chocolate marmalade washed down with a glass of chocolate milk. I'm very pleased with you this morning, Mrs. Midas said as she helped John on with his coat. If you promise to eat your lunch at school as well as you ate your breakfast, I'll give you a dime to buy some chocolates with. Oh, that's all right, John said. I don't think I'll need it. 
Mrs. Midas looked puzzled as she waved goodbye. Okay. So, oh, trying to fix it won't won't work. All right, so the story ended with John refusing the money that his mom was giving him for chocolate. So now here's your job. Your job is to Sorry, it won't work for some reason. Your job is to now go online and do your two assignments on Google Classroom. One of the assignments is questions. It's asking you just four questions about the story. And you can go back to Epic Books and find the answer. You can use the book in your hands if you have one or just use your brain and what you remembered. Then, the second assignment is a vocabulary assignment. And on this assignment, you have to define four words. When you define words, you tell what they mean. So if I were to define the word repeated, repeated means to say again and again. In the story, they said that he had repeated what his mom had said. Then there was the word coaxing. The candy man was coaxing him into the store. When you're coaxing someone to do something, you're encouraging them to do it. Then there was the story hesitate. When you hesitate to do something, that means that you are thinking about not doing it. You would, you are hesitating you are thinking, maybe I won't do this. Maybe it's not a good idea. And the final word was related. If something is related, it's familiar. So you can use several different ways to get the definitions of the words. If you have a dictionary, you can look up the word. If you have a computer, you can go to Google and write, type in the word with the word definition. Or if you have Alexa, you can ask Alexa what the word means. For instance, Alexa, Sorry, I don't know. Alexa, what are lozenges? Oh, she's answering on the wrong. Um, Alexa. What are lozenges? A throat lozenge is a small, typically medicated tablet intended to be dissolved slowly in the mouth to temporarily stop coughs, lubricate, and soothe irritated tissues of the throat, possibly from the common cold or influenza. Cough tablets have taken the name lozenge based on their original. Okay, shape. stop, Alexa. Loz so, do you see how it can be used? Okay, Alexa, stop. So do you see how I could have used any of those methods? So now I can go on to my um, computer and at the top, I'm going to type the word bristles. It said that the bristles on his toothpick brush came off. A bristle is a short, stiff hair, typically one of those of an animal skin. And it says, they stand upright away from the skin, especially in anger or fear if it's on someone's skin. But the bristles that they show are bristles on a paintbrush or a toothbrush. It's a short, stiff hair. So those are your two assignments that you're going to be in charge of doing this morning. You only have to tell me what five of the words mean that are brand new words that were introduced in these chapters. And you have to answer the four questions that are on there, which are pretty easy.